Welcome to a spiritual offering from Trinity Episcopal Church in Boonville with the sermon of Mother Linda Logan for the seventh Sunday after Pentecost. <laughs> In the name of the one holy God, creator, redeemer, sustainer. Amen. Have we got stories this morning? Stories that feature dancing, but dancing with some serious subtext. The first of these stories comes from the second book of Samuel. This is the account of the triumphal procession of the Ark of God into Jerusalem. The Ark is described in the book of Exodus as a portable wooden chest designed to carry the tablets of the law that God gave the people. It represents the presence of God, so it goes with the people to guide them in the wilderness, to lead them in war, and to be the place where the leading of God is sought. The ark comes to be regarded as the footstool above which God is invisibly enthroned. But in the first book of Samuel, 
The ark has been captured in battle by the Philistines. This is intriguing, given what the ark represented. Though the text points to the degeneration of the priesthood at the hands of the sons of Eli, there isn't any reason given for Israel's defeat at the hands of the Philistines. The story just tells us that the ark was carried off by the Philistines. And since wars between nations were regarded as contests between the nation's gods, the ark was taken to the city of Ashdod and placed in the temple of Dagon, the Philistines' god. But the statue of Dagon fell on its face before the ark two days in a row, the second day ending up in pieces. And the people of Ashdod were struck with a plague of tumors. The ark was sent from one Philistine city to another, and at each place the inhabitants were struck with tumors. So the priests of the Philistines advised sending the ark back to Israel with an offering to the God of Israel an offering of five gold tumors and five gold mice, representing the plague that had devastated the Philistines' five cities. If the cows that pull the cart head straight to Israelite territory, rather than go in search of their calves, the priest said, the Philistines will know that it was the God of the Israelites that had struck their cities with plague. And that was what happened. The cows that pulled the cart headed straight to Israelite territory, and there it remained. All through the rise and fall of Saul as king over Israel. Now, the story we read today is from the second book of Samuel. David has survived all of Saul's attacks on him and, following Saul's death, has become first king of Judah, then, following a long war, also king of Israel. Where we join the story, David, with 30,000 men, has gone to retrieve the ark and bring it to Jerusalem, an act which would make the city the religious as well as the political capital. Along the way, he sacrifices an ox and a fatling, and he dances before the Lord with all his might, girded with a linen ephod. Now, before I cast any aspersions against David and his actions, you need to know that the text casts aspersions. The books of First and Second Samuel contain a number of traditions about the early beginnings of the monarchy. And some of those traditions are in favor of the monarchy, and some are opposed. And running through the story are incidents which cast shadows on the character of David. One of these shows up in today's reading. David has taken a number of wives. That was a way of sealing treaties with foreign powers. But he demands that his wife Michal, Saul's daughter, whom Saul had taken away a number of years before, be returned to him from her second husband. David's demand is part of a political bargain 
to gain the support of Saul's followers, for it is through marriage to Saul's daughter that he claims a right to Saul's kingdom. Has anyone asked Michal her feelings about this? Probably not, but they show up in this passage from 2 Samuel. David, a warrior and king, has taken on the action of a priest. The very action her father took when Samuel did not show up on the appointed day. And the people who had gone with Saul to fight the Philistines had begun to slip away. Saul offered the sacrifice himself. And it was for this that he was condemned by God and the role of king was taken from him. David has also put on the attire of a priest. He is wearing a linen ephod, which probably was a short garment just tied around the waist or hips. So when David leaped and danced and whirled about, he exposed himself to criticism. Michal, seeing him leaping and dancing, despised him in her heart. And, as Robert Alter points out, Michal is identified in this passage and its continuation as daughter of Saul, not wife of David. And the person she looks on is identified as King David, not David, her husband. See how the text makes comments? Now, the other story we had this morning, the one from the Gospel of Mark, is the murder of John the Baptist. It's an awful story. The details are stomach-churning. And the fact that such a great man meets his end at the hands of a girl acting as an agent of evil is too disquieting to really take in. The story has all the flavor of a folk tale. And we need to take note of the fact that the story, as Mark tells it, is at variance with the account of John's death given by the first century Jewish historian Josephus. Josephus stresses Herod's fear of John as a popular leader as one who could incite the people to insurrection. But Mark's telling, with its angry, offended queen as the instigator, and a royal princess dancing before the king's guests as if she were a prostitute, and a king making a rash vow in the presence of all those guests, has the advantage that storytelling always has over the mere recitation of fact. And that is its capacity for exploiting the emotion that dwells within the facts. And the emotion that permeates this story is fear. Fear is all around in this story of the end of John the Baptist. But if we look at the story from 2 Samuel from the perspective of the only person whose inner thoughts are given, 
we see a similar emotion. For as our bishop commented in a different context this week, anger has fear lying behind it, the fear of loss. And McCall's losses are overwhelming. She has lost her father, who, before he died, had lost both his sanity and the kingdom. She has lost her brother Jonathan, who, like she herself, had saved the life of David. And she has lost both David, whom she loved, and Paul Deal, the husband who loved her. And now, returned to David to cement a political alliance, she sees him taking her father's place as king. And, in offering sacrifice, carrying out the very action for which her father was condemned by God. And in dancing and leaping about, exposing himself to his and her humiliation. Do you sometimes wonder why we read these stories in church? Because for all the unpalatable detail, for all the fact that some of what we read does not accord with historical record, the emotion at the heart of it does accord with human experience. And the overarching narrative in which the individual stories are set is that of God moving us on to humanity. So be it. This has been a spiritual offering from Trinity Episcopal Church on Schuyler Street in Boonville. 
Thank you for listening, and we invite you to join us for our weekly services at 9 o'clock Sunday mornings.